wonderful trip. But when I got to England, I signed off and uh, I went on other ships as a hairdresser. Uh, I did catering more than hairdressing. Hairdressing was really a business I had on the ship. And I, I did a lot of that. And this went on for about 17 years. I could go into a lifetime of stories of what happened at sea, but I, it was wonderful. The only thing at sea which I disliked was as you got older, you, there was a fear that um, what was going to happen to you. And then some nights I would lay in the bunk and I'd curl up in a ball and I'd think to myself, you know, I've got no one to go with, no no family to go with. So when I went back to, came back to England, I would land up in a hostel or into the seamen's missions, you know? And I, I, did, I, I was very lonely, very lonely. And then after a while, I, I didn't want to live anymore, so I attempted suicide about three or four times. Poplar Hospital, which is gone now, that was one time, and then other places. And I decided that um, uh, I can't live as I was. It came to a sort of peak that it was either I die, I kill myself, or I, get, I become a, a female. I'd seen people who had the female and they looked awful, you know, and, um, and yet there was one, Margaret, she, she had the change. Although she was six foot something, she looked reasonably as a female. And I was smaller, so I thought, you know, I'm only 5'7", I thought I could do that. And people said that I, I, I looked all right and that. And um, so I decided to do it. And one day I got a flat. Um, I got all my clothes. I burnt them outside in the garden. Um, and I put them all in a thing about and burnt everything, all my photographs, everything in my past. And I started as a female. Um, I, no, before I did all that, I got the flat and I actually got a job uh, on the trains going from Victoria to, to Dover first for about six months. Then I finished that and then I decided to actually change and I, then I got all the clothes and I did that. So anyway, I, I decided to become a woman. It was very frightening because I had no one to help me. So I, I can remember it so well that I used to put my makeup on. I would always get up about five o'clock in the morning and start to get ready to go out. And I'll put the makeup on and, and uh, get my clothes out. They'd all have to be clean and neat and tidy. And then I would look in the mirror, keep looking in the mirror and I would look worse and worse. So I put more my makeup on. And, you know, and I feel good and then I'll sit down and I've got to wait for the time and this and that. By the time I finish, I've got too much makeup on, overdone it, you know, and I must have gone in the street looking a fright. That's because you didn't have somebody with you to say, look, you don't need this, you don't need that. I made all the classical mistakes which one can do uh, to become a female. I made them all. Wrong clothes, too young for me or too old for me. Everything that was wrong, I didn't have the guidance. Eventually I came under Dr. Randall at the um, hospital, what was it, where everybody has the change. <laughs> yes, it was um, uh, Dr. Randall at the Hammersmith Hospital. And I would go to him uh, I would go dress every so many months, every three months, and he was very strict. A lot of people uh, have, uh, have been turned down by him, and people have died because of that. Um, and I've seen people, he'll say, no, you, I can never put you through to have the change because you can't have it for some reason or other. And it was very sad for many people I spoke to there. 
we'd all sit outside, wait to be called in, and he would come, he would, he would go in and he would say, sit down, and he was very harsh. Sometimes he may have a load of students there, and he'll make you undress, and he will point with a stick at certain areas of your body, and I would cry. But he wasn't a bad man. He wasn't a bad man. He was doing it for your own good. He wanted you to realize that it was either right for you or it wasn't. He would put his in, but the outcome will be you. Anyhow, after a long, quite a long period of time, you had to live as three years as a woman. And I watched it. I think I was just under three years or something like that. Anyway. But uh, eventually he said, would I go to Brighton and have it done there? So I said, yes. So I went to Brighton, to Hove Hospital, had it done in 1982. And um, it was a great success. Uh, had a few problems, learning to pee <laughs> again. <laughs> which was very good because your muscles are gone. You know, they don't work when you first have it done. So you just start to fill up and then you burst. <laughs> it's very unpleasant. But anyway, uh, I had the operation and um, I was on hormones. And I'd st I got a job with Ta Hamlets. Um, well, sorry, this, I must go back again. I'm going too fast ahead of myself. I did start with Tower Hamlets, uh, working as, dressed up as a female. You know, when I changed into Winnebow, I got the job first with, in 1978. And uh, I was still male, but I dressed as a female. And I did hairdressing for the mentally ill and people with um, uh, Alzheimer's and uh, in a, uh, a home in my land next to the pub, the Horn of Plenty. It was the, what was the name of that home? Oval or something like that. Anyhow, I worked there for a while and then also did hairdressing in other uh, old people's homes in Tower Hamlets and day centres for, uh, to teach young people hygiene, uh, people with um, uh, mental issues hygiene and things like that, and also to cut hair of people uh, that sort of uh, never grew. They mentally ill and they let they were laying on the ground in, and you would cut their hair and things like that, but they were totally mentally ill. They were, I don't know how to explain them to you. They were adults, but they were alive, but they were not yeah, it was sad. They they couldn't talk. They couldn't do this. Or they make these noises and wet themselves and so on. But anyhow, it wasn't bad. For that. I quite enjoyed it, and I did hairdressing for quite a while with them, and in other old people's homes. And then, um, 1984, 83, 84, I was offered a job um, to run a sheltered accommodation, or it was just being built. Now, the strange thing was that um, this has gone all the way through my life, actually. This sort of thing has happened. Even as a child, it happened. But I, what you call it, I was walking past this derelict building. Um, it's just starting to build. And, there, and somebody had told me that it was going to be an old people's home. And I said to my partner, uh, I'm going to run this place when it opens. And he said, it's, they're just starting to build it. I said, uh, he, he said, it's going to be an old people's home. I said, yeah, I'm going to run it. And he says, no, you can't do it. He said, how do you know that? I said, I don't know. So they're done cementing on the ground. And I wrote in it with my finger, A and G loves J. And just that. And I said, this will prove it. Anyhow, years later, when they finished built it, I was offered the job to go there. Just